My people, welcome back to your favorite show, You and I Talk Show with Louis Zuacho. This week, we're talking about sex, okay? So if you have issues with that, don't tune in, okay? You have been warned. My people, welcome to the sexy version of you and I. All right, today on the show, Maureen McGrath, and you are yourself a talk show host, CKNW on Sundays, The Sex Show. That's right, I host the CKNW Sunday Night Sex Show at 8 o'clock on Sunday evenings. The sexy voice is you. <laughs> <laughs> takes more than a voice to host a sex show. <laughs> yes. So how did you how did you get started? And was it always about sex or did you start with something else? Oh wow, that's a great question. You know, I actually was a regular health commentator on the Christy Clark show several years back. I was asked to fill in for a colleague of mine about a medical subject and on a business and politics show. Yes. And I thought, well, what better to talk about than low sexual desire in women? Because at the time, I was running some clinical trials for a medication for low sexual desire. And when I put an ad in the Vancouver Sun, about 500 women contacted me and Ooh. said, your ad spoke to me. Oh, what so was the ad saying? The ad was asking for women between the ages of 24 and 44 who were in a committed relationship, long than a year who wanted to remain in that relationship who were not on antidepressants who were experiencing low sexual desire in their relationship mm -hmm. so these are women who are supposed to have a regular sex drive but it's low that's right one would imagine or one would think that these women especially premenopausal women would have high sexual desire or healthy sexual desire or libido or sexual interest. But as it turned out, many women in very secretive ways were living, or they were living a very secretive way about their low sexual desire. Wow. So you're also a registered nurse? Yes. So is this something that you saw at the hospital uh, in order for the issue to come to your attention or what was... No, I have a research background as well. I have a clinical practice where I see patients who experience all sorts of sexual disorders and dysfunction, mm -hmm. but I also have a research background, and so I was running these clinical trials about sexual desire to okay. test this medication that's now been approved in the States. It's called Addy, and, or, or it was the generic form was, term was uh, flubanserin. Mm -hmm. So it'll be available in Canada probably within a year, but it doesn't work for every woman. Uh huh. So um, I've seen like, uh, and I've read stories and seen movies about like uh, researchers in the past about sex, and then they themselves, they kind of research on themselves, you know? I like they involve that. themselves. <laughs> I mean, you've seen like doctors and they're having sex, but they're doing research, but it's part of, it's their research, you right. know? And I've seen they're connecting themselves to the machines. You've seen that movie with Kinsey, I think, where yes. he's researching, but he's also at the kind Kinsey of Institute. Yeah. Yes, and Masters and Johnson actually started this research in the '50s, yes. and they held sexual health clinical trials right in their lab, and, mm -hmm. and actually had people have sex in their lab, and yes. that a lot was learned about women experiencing orgasm during those trials. And and I've been involved in clinical trials here uh -huh. in Vancouver uh -huh. around ejaculation for men with spinal cord injury, for example, and women with low sexual desire low interest. Yes, yeah, so there are a lot of clinical trials going on here in uh, Vancouver. So have you yourself been part of one or experimented with yourself, or is this something that you can't talk about? <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly have never had that question before. <laughs> Not about me. That said, uh -huh. uh, the, a lot of sexual health aids and devices are uh, that I recommend to patients, okay. of course, I have my own, you could say I have my own little research center, yeah. and I, I test them out myself, uh -huh. just so that I can be assured that these are good recommendations for my patients. Yeah. So I brought some of those today. Yes, people, my... just so you know, we're going to be showing you a couple of those uh, things, like, later on, you know, we want to talk to you first, like, sex, you got to talk devices. first, right? <laughs> yes. But we're going to show you some stuff later on. 
Wow. So, and then, so you go and speak, and then all of a sudden, people want you to speak more about it. Well, the phone boards lit up that day when we spoke about low sexual desire in women. And I was deemed the sexpert on that day, and they asked me to return. And I was a regular health commentator for a few years. And then I thought it was time for my own show. So yes. about three and a half years ago, I approached the, the station. And to their credit, they said, yes, we think that uh, having a sex show is valuable yeah. here because it's, it's so important for people and sex is related to everything or everything's related to sex. Mm -hmm. But oh, so are women supposed to have a high sex drive? You know, because I'm thinking if you're a woman and you have a high sex drive, people start calling you names. This is one of the problems. This is one of the issues. Women are socialized very differently around sex, in fact, and they're, they're taught that sex is a commodity and that it's one way to advance in life. They're also taught to be ashamed about their sexual desire. So it's fine for men to have sexual desire. Yeah, like, and, you know, exactly. go for it. Yes, that's right. <laughs> You're the man. Add them up. And they They're congratulate the each other when right. they go, oh, I High smash. Five. Yes. <laughs> One after another, and they want to have sex with women, and then even men slut shame women after they've had sex with them, and women also slut shame women. So it's a little bit of a taboo, it's shrouded in shame for women to say they have high sexual desire. Nobody's supposed to have high sexual desire. There's a continuum, but there is a healthy sexual desire that everybody uh, can have. Okay. So we're gonna talk a short break, and then maybe when we come back, we, we can talk about those different levels. Certainly. Can I find out where I am? Absolutely. <laughs> it depends how your maybe life is. Maybe we don't talk about it on TV, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll be back. You and I talk show with Louise Uachu. We love you, the authors, the musicians, the comedians, the entrepreneurs, and all other talented and inspiring people. Please contact info at uachu.com to be a guest on the show. Okay, my people, welcome back to the show. So we just mentioned, somebody in the studio just mentioned that whatever we tell you today, don't go broadcasting it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so what is like high sexual drive and low sexual drive? And, and so, so what if somebody doesn't have like the sexual drive, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is, especially if they're in a committed relationship, comes down to desire discrepancy. Okay. So one of the couple may have a higher sex drive than the other and their sexual needs are not being met. This can lead to porn, it can lead to infidelity, it can lead to other issues, uh, unhappiness, and, and even divorce in a relationship. Mm -hmm. So just desire discrepancy is a, is a big concern. But many things impact sexual desire, especially for women, the type of life they're leading, number one. Women are doing it all, but never doing it these mm -hmm. days. So they're working in and outside of the home, raising children, caring for aging parents, they're volunteering at the school, they're attending to everything, trying to live this perfect life, and oftentimes the home fires are not lit. Yes. <laughs> and that may cause an issue because they can become exhausted with this life and all of the expectations and the demands placed on women today. Uh -huh. So they can be so tired and fatigue is the number one reason for low sexual desire in women. Mm -hmm. Don't men already complain that women are always talking about how they're tired or they're talking about how they have some sort of headaches? Isn't That's an excuse. <laughs> Headaches are an excuse. Playing dead is another excuse. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, women are exhausted and will, you know, certainly when you're in a relationship, the sexual desire will decrease over time. So you, one can't expect to have the same sexual desire throughout the relationship, especially a long-term relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's helpful sometimes to spice things up or introduce some health aids or sex toys into uh -huh. the bedroom. Uh -huh. uh, but be mindful as well, being mindful of your relationship and placing that as the highest order of importance mm -hmm. is vital for intimacy. So the most important thing in the relationship is sex? 
I would say so, but I do host a sex show, so it could be a biased <laughs> opinion. <laughs> it's what else very could be important. more important? It's very important for people who want to have sex, mm -hmm. and some couples do not want to engage in sex, and that is fine. But if you want to engage in sex in your relationship and your sexual needs are not being met, it is something that would need to be addressed uh, to have a healthy relationship. So I'm thinking that in most cases, it may be men who have a higher sex drive than women. And do you have cases where the woman has a higher sex drive than the men and that is the problem in the couple? Absolutely. The men can experience low sexual desire as well. And we often see that with low testosterone levels mm -hmm. or that when they're stressed or if they are consuming uh, recreational drugs like alcohol and marijuana, for example, mm -hmm. will impact a person's sexual desire. Anyone who has unresolved conflict in a relationship, that may convert to low sexual desire. We see it a little bit more commonly in women, in large part because of the lives that they're leading and also the lack of sexual health education that they receive. Many women don't know their bodies. And it's very important that you know yourself before you enter into a relationship. So explore yourself is very important. Touch yourself so that you can communicate to your partner what feels good and what doesn't feel good. So it's not a sin? You're like, because you know, some people have also been taught that you're going to be going to hell. This so is you're true. saying, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hell. I'm Catholic. <laughs> yes. huh? Rick, and sex is for procreation in the Catholic Church. Yes. That's you right. know, so what, like, how do you feel about this? Well, there are some patriarchal attitudes uh -huh. in particular religions, uh -huh. and uh, so one has to make their decisions for themselves. And uh, so taking everything into consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, sex has been taught as a sin to many people. Mm -hmm. Many people experience guilt around sex as well. I have a patient who was a 72-year-old woman. She was never able to experience an orgasm because every time she reached the plateau of the female sexual response cycle, her mother entered her head and all she heard was her mother saying, sex is dirty, sex is bad. So a lot of women receive those negative messages about sex and that is probably one of the contributing factors to why only 33% of women have ever experienced an orgasm. Only 33% of women? That's right, yes. Whoa. Yes, and 70% of women require clitoral stimulation to experience orgasm. And that's another- 70%. Yes, they require clitoral stimulation. Mm -hmm. So many- But most people don't even know what the uh, clitoris does. A lot of women don't realize that there are twice as many nerves in the clitoris than there are in the glands of the penis and it's a very much an erogenous zone. And so they're expecting, because they have had very little education about sex, that internal orgasms are what is to be experienced. Uh -huh. So, Do people need to describe uh, what an orgasm is at some point so that people may know if they had it or not? Or is it that if you've had it, you, you would know? Well, I think it's any, any kind of education is important and people learn differently. So I think if we can describe it, that would be great. Or if a person can describe it or a woman can, descri can describe what she's experienced. Okay. And that may be helpful as well. Okay, so before we go for the break, can you describe to people? <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is this? You know, like a, a little picture, right? <laughs> you remember the movie When Harry Met Sally? <laughs> yes. <laughs> In the restaurant. Well, it can be described as an overwhelming. I've never had an orgasm myself, so I don't know. I'm, t I'm oh, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so your boyfriend or husband is watching. It's like, what? <laughs> no, it can be an overwhelming feeling of an incredible pleasure. There are physical changes that occur. Um, and there's uh, the increased heart rate, and it can, women have described it as shivering, um, you know, head to toe, and uh, just a complete bliss, and it's as it plateaus. And it's important that women understand the female sexual response cycle, which is begins the linear model. It begins with desire, and then arousal, which uh, you get genital engorgement and lubrication, and it's a very pleasurable feeling, and you want to remain within that intimate relationship. And then there's a plateau, which occurs just prior to, which is it's a bit of a steady state prior to orgasm, and then that release. Oof, okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> Getting hot in here, people. Yes. Let's go for a break, okay? <laughs> go uh, plateau, whatever it is that you'll be doing in the break. We'll be back. <laughs> you and I talk show with Louis Zuachu. We love you, the authors, the musicians, the comedians, the entrepreneurs, and all other talented and inspiring people. Please contact info at uwachu.com to be a guest on the show. Okay, my people, we're back for uh, from the uh, um, orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then in case you need help, we're going to talk about the stuff that you have in that little cute bag <laughs> that may help. So the first thing that you're going to show people is called what? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Uh -huh. Let's see what we have yeah. in my yeah. little bag for let's you. See. Let's my see what's in tricks. the bag before. <laughs> Lots of choices for you uh -huh. here. Uh -huh. I'll save the best for last. Ooh. A common... We're only going to show you three things, by the way. All right. So no kids watching at this time. And I'm going time, to hopefully. avoid the... Um, <laughs> First of all, I'd like to say it's very important for women to have a healthy vagina. Mm. And, so and what is uh, what does what does uh, that mean? What does a healthy vagina uh, a look healthy like? <laughs> smell like? It's pink. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's it doesn't smell. Uh -huh. Vagina is like a self-cleaning uh -huh. oven. So today we're like uh, uh, we're pink like yeah. the vagina. Should be. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Hot pink, like the vagina should be. Uh -huh. And um, but often. Uh, estrogen decreases in the vagina, and estrogen is the hormone regulator of the vagina, and that helps a woman become moist and lubricated during sex, so she doesn't necessarily need lubricants during sex, because sex can be, can be painful for women who experience vaginal dryness. So the one product I'd like to say is Joy Gel, mm -hmm. and so that is an all-natural product that has African yam in it, so it's a natural estrogen, has coconut oil, vitamin E, hyaluronic acid to help with tissues. So that's a great um, So that will bring some African vibes in there. Absolutely, All darling, right. yes. And, um, and We're going to Africa before, uh, you, you know what happens. <laughs> no need to go there, you can stay here. But a lot of, 70% of women will experience vaginal dryness, and that's mm -hmm. a result of breastfeeding, mm -hmm. being on the birth control pill, perimenopause, and menopause, so very important. So what, what about those people, the women who have a diet, they're already eating yam. Are you saying yam is good for you? Y yam can be good for you, but this is topical. It's applied straight to the vagina uh -huh. two or three times a week at night. Uh -huh. It'll help to keep the tissues nice and healthy. Oh, okay. So this is not like and before you have sex. No, oh. no. This is a continuous... Oh. Treatment, so you use that two or three times a week, uh -huh. and it'll help you to have your own natural lubrication, which is always best, and will also assist with experiencing orgasm for women. So I like that. So well, it's already called joy. Joy gel. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd like to bring out the magic banana. <laughs> the magic banana. Yes, because okay, the okay. pelvic floor is really important in uh -huh. terms of sexual sensation uh -huh. for women. Uh -huh. and so this is still for women. This is still for women. Where is yes. this going? This is actually going into the healthy vagina after you've inserted the joy gel. Ooh. And uh, so for those of us who can hold up the Lionsgate Bridge, because we've been doing Kegel exercises for a long time, uh -huh. this is inserted into the woman's vagina uh -huh. all the way uh -huh. in, uh -huh. and a woman does Kegel exercises around this, so uh -huh. she squeezes her rectal muscle, uh -huh. the muscle that prevents you from passing gas, uh -huh. and that will help to strengthen the pelvic floor, increase blood flow, and help with sexual sensation. Uh -huh. So that's the magic banana. It was, it was designed by a yoga instructor and it's also in addition to being the best little Kegel exerciser out there it will um, it's a female sexual exploration device and about 50% of women will experience an internal or g-spot orgasm after use using that interesting yes. and so how long are you supposed to keep that uh, on or in the 24 hours seven days a week no I'm kidding <laughs> It's so much fun. No, you do it about five or six times. You can do it, you know, two, three, four, five times a day. Do about five to ten. Kegel Which way does it go? It goes in the other. It's going way. in. This is the vagina. Okay. And it goes in this way. Oh. Okay. And as you get stronger, so the you black thing is staying outside. Yes, the black okay. thing stays outside. And you just squeeze around it, and as you get stronger, you pull it out, uh -huh. and uh, there's increased resistance. So that's, it's very so important. So is the whole thing supposed to go in? Yes, the entire thing goes in. The vagina, when it's healthy, uh -huh. is elastic, and, uh -huh. and it stretches to uh -huh. accommodate a penis, or more um, impressive is the baby's head. So it, it yeah. is... Um, 
it, as long as the tissues are healthy, it will stretch. Uh -huh. So this is nothing. So that's why size matters. People talking about size doesn't matter. Size, size matters. Men are more concerned about their penis size than uh -huh. women are. Uh -huh. In fact, painful sex is such a common issue that women would prefer a smaller penis. So, you know, I know guys at attach their self-esteem to the size of their penis. Yeah. But I know how big they all are anyway. <laughs> Um, the average penis when erect is only about five to six inches long. So women are nervous that the penis might be too large because they may experience painful sex, if they have, especially if they have vaginal dryness. So that's, again, the joy gel. But and see, the thing is that um, how can a penis ever hurt a woman when women pop out babies? Well, that hurts too. Oh, 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 yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, well, there's deep dyspareunia. So, if it's too, the thrusting is too hard uh, or too strong for a woman, that may lead to some pain. Women have about 16% of women experience vaginal pain from a number of different reasons: vulvodynia, vaginismus, a spasm. So, there are many, many reasons for vaginal pain. It's a very okay. The common. third one before we go. The for third break. one before we go is, and my favorite. <laughs> is the womanizer. And so Ooh, this is the womanizer. Womanizer. It is a clitoral suckling device. So it's very different from a um, it's very different from a vibrator. Mm -hmm. So as you see, I put the you see that little red beam. Uh -huh. And so, you know, you have to instruct men what feels good and where it feels good, but this little baby uh -huh. knows exactly where it feels good. And so I, I prescribe this to a lot of women who are in relationships where the men may have erectile dysfunction or, um, the, or they have never been able to experience an orgasm. And so this uh, will do it. Oh, wow. Okay, <laughs> we'll take a show break and look that closely. <laughs> You and I talk show with Louise Uachu. We love you, the authors, the musicians, the comedians, the entrepreneurs, and all other talented and inspiring people. Please contact info at uachu.com to be a guest on the show. Okay, my sexy people, we are back and we are still talking to Maureen McGrath. Wow, that's... Uh, well, after this, I mean, when a couple comes to you and they tell you they're having this issue, after you consult with them, how long does it take before they come back to, you know, like a nice flow where you, where you would want them to be? Well, it really depends on the diagnosis. And one thing I've learned through my clinical practice is I have to find out how the patients are having sex. Because my definition of having sex may not be the same as theirs. And I've learned that some people are who are maybe wanting to get pregnant and they're poorly educated about sex for whatever reason they may be he may be ejaculating into her navel or into her belly button because he didn't understand that it needed to be penetrative sex i've had it, other couples who when i'm trying to ascertain how they're having sex they tell me that well she never takes her pants off so the there are many different They're practices. They're having sex right? with the, the but, woman ever taking her pants off? Well, they weren't exactly having sex. That was the <laughs> but they thought they were. Okay. So, um, so but diagnosis is key uh -huh. and getting to the root of the problem. What uh -huh. is the problem? Is it around shame? Is it around embarrassment? Is it body image issues? A lot of women experience body image issues. A lot of women are not vulnerable or not at peace with themselves. We have a lot of broken people. Many women have been sexually abused as children, and that's another altogether different situation. Does it take away somebody's uh, sexual desire or change it? It changes their attitude about sex, and they often feel that sex is dirty and sex is shameful, and they hate sex, and they really don't want to. Many couples will not consummate the relationship uh, because of sexual abuse as a child. Wow. Yes, and they can go years without consummating uh -huh. the relationship. Uh -huh. So you really have to get to the problem and ask permission. I use the plicit model in my clinical practice. You ask permission to ask particular questions. You provide limited information to them, what they can handle at the time, and then I advise specific suggestions for them to take home and try in the comfort of their own home. And then if I need to send them off to more intensive therapy, then I will do that. Wow, so what's the best way to have sex net? And where should this be happening? And who are these two people? Like, what, what is their way of thinking? Like, what is the ideal situation? 
Well, to be completely open and vulnerable and in a trusting, mutual, consenting relationship. Communication is key. Talking about your sexual desires or fantasies with your partner. Fantasy is very important. So it's okay to actually be in a relationship with one person and fantasize about some somebody else. Already? Oh, Absolutely. We often nice, have to do nice, that to nice. keep things flowing. Uh -huh. So, you know, there's no perfect relationship, but if two people are happy and they're happy that, that their sexual needs are being met and, and there's a exploration and sex play and it's fun and both are being pleasured, Uh, and, and having health benefits as a result of it, then that's probably the ideal. Mm -hmm. So you're saying sex is good. Sex is great. And it's good for you. <laughs> oh, it's, it's fabulous for you. It helps with mood. And you're not going to hell. Pain. Well, I might be, but uh, I'll, I'll be going for everybody out there. Um, but it's good for mood and pain and sleep. And, uh -huh. you know, sometimes I say it's the best medicine. So this is why you still look so fresh, so young, so sexy, eh? I see your I don't know about now. that. I'm I don't know about you being on the radio. I think you should be on television I, more. Face for radio, that's for sure. <laughs> But I'm passionate about this subject because uh -huh. it is related to health, and I think it's really important that we have the discussion. And I thank you so much for even daring to. Uh, well, have you know, this. I had to like go pray. You know, I, I think I'm gonna have to go to pray after this. Too. I'm going to confession myself, but that's okay. I'll be absolved of my uh -huh, sin. Uh -huh. um, but it's not a sin. You know, it's it's healthy and it's good for you. Helps with sleep. You know, I think it's better than a medication, a prescribed medication for sleep or a sedative because it can actually relax people and, and help people to settle and have a better night's sleep. And, and it, it's so important to be intimate with your partner and bond with your partner and, and be able to express yourself sexually in whatever way yeah. you'd like. And I know we don't have that much time remaining, but there's also the issue of uh, divorce, you know, so many people divorcing. Do you that's think right. that's also related to the sex issue? I mean, how many divorces in percentage are related to the sex problem? It's so common that now when a divorced person comes to my clinical practice and tells me that they are divorced and they may want to go online dating or they may want to deal with some issues, they may want to deal with their vaginal dryness now, and I'll say, uh, how long had it been Uh, before you had sex with your partner. And they'll often say it was five or six years or 10 years that we went without sex. Wow, that's, but that's they're still living in the same house? No, they. It, yes, that can happen as well. Uh -huh. Many people are in sexless marriages, about 20%, according to a Time magazine. So they think survey. they're brothers and sisters or what? They <laughs> act like brothers and sisters. And, and oftentimes just sex falls off the shelf and they forget about it or they let time pass or they're too busy or there's many different reasons. You know, it cannot be that intimate. 10% of people check their smartphones during sex. 35% of people check their smartphones right after sex. So technology plays a role as well. Their cheating can happen online these days. So emotional affairs are very common and very damaging. <sighs> okay. <laughs> My people, unfortunately, you know, this is a huge subject. I think we're going to have to have Maureen back. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. We're going to keep talking about this because this is an ongoing issue. And then my sexy people just listen to what she's been saying. Don't listen to me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. Wow, Maureen. Wow. <laughs> Thank you.